and um, which is which is all about making science more accessible, more open, and helping to incorporate more societal perspectives into the research process. Today, we're going to be sharing our experiences and um, learnings from the project and hope to provide you with some inspiration and ideas to, that will inform your own work. As our project is coming to an end in September, um, this event is one of key, three key dissemination activities for us, and we'll be sharing details at the end about two other events that we're holding in September, um, where you can learn even more about what we've been learning through the project. So the format for today is uh, firstly an introduction to what we've been doing in the Orion project, and then you'll be able to choose from two parallel breakouts where we're going to be holding conversations with project partners to find out more about some of these methodologies and really delve into their experiences and learnings. And then we'll bring back everyone together again for some final discussion and reflections. So before we get started, I'd just like to say, please feel free to post questions and comments in the chat throughout the whole of the event. We'd love to love to hear from you. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Maria Hargott, um, and fellow moderator for the event. Maria is from VA Public and Science as well. Um, so we can find out a bit more about you and who is participating in this event today. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Helen. So we would like to know a little bit more about you who, who are here in the session. So please, uh, Fiva, go to themendi.com and use the code 57679271, which I also post in the chat right now. I would like, first of all, to hear, where are you right now? Where are you located? Where are you joining from? Let's see if you have any results coming in. So I have a lot of people coming, joining from Berlin, from Germany at all. We have some Switzerland, some from Vienna, Mallorca, Cardiff, Munich, all over Europe, seems like. Paris and some from Stockholm. So another question that we would like to know is what stakeholder group do you represent? Are you, for instance, a researcher, a public engagement officer, policymaker, funder, business, civil society, or any other stakeholder? Quite a lot of researchers. And we also have some other. For you who answered other, maybe you can type in the chat which group you represent. That's not mentioned. And then uh, as this session is about co-creation and dialogue, what kind of, what level of experience do you have of co-creation with stakeholders? So it's quite equal between none and some. So I hope this session will give you some inspiration and some uh, advice on how to do co-creation dialogue with stakeholders. And for you who have answered then some, uh, we have a last question. Uh, what type of science engagement and co-creation experience do you have? That could be, for instance, do you have done any co-creation activities or any public engagement activities? Theoretic experience? Perhaps general, any science engagement, yeah, public engagement activities, just the different types of ones that be school students. Just put in there. Brilliant. Perfect. We just want to capture your experience and see what what experience we have in, in this uh, session. Oh, there's quite a lot. Wow. Collaboration, concepting workshops, citizen dialogues. This is a very experienced crowd we have here, Helen. <laughs> Excellent. Lots of citizen science. Oh, this is great.
It's still coming in. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's quite a collection, isn't it, Maria? Yeah, citizen science is really prominent. Yeah. Great. Brilliant. Right, you can uh, continue uh, inputting those if you if you want, but we're just going to move on. So thanks. That's great to see who is uh, who's in the room with us today. So thank you, Maria. Um, so now I would like to introduce Michaela Bertero, who's the project coordinator of the Orion project, and she's head of International and Scientific Affairs Office at the Centre for Genomic Regulation in Spain. And Michaela is going to give you an overview of the Orion project and what we've been up to over the last four years. So over to you, Michaela. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Maria, for kickstarting the workshop. Uh, welcome to everybody. It's, it's a pleasure and it's exciting to see uh, such a diverse uh, crowd. So although we cannot see each other and, and talk directly in person, I hope we can still have a lively discussion. Before actually I say a few words on Orion, we thought to show you a brief, a brief movie uh, to illustrate what Orion is, is about. At the heart of Orion Open Science is the ambition to open up the way we fund, organise and do research in life sciences and biomedicine. We did this by organising a range of co-creation experiments, as well as providing training to help researchers apply open science and adopt the principles of responsible research and innovation. The Spanish Institute of Health, Carlos III in Madrid, the main national funder in biomedicine, is actively promoting open science and RRI in its practices, institutes and projects. In Orion, they awarded several RRI prizes to reward their accredited institutes for putting in practice gender equality, co-creation, research integrity or other ingredients to foster RRI. Another funder, JCMM in the Czech Republic, awarded new regional grants to junior researchers to tackle societal challenges in their region following the principles of open science. There were additional innovative activities, including a number of co-creation projects organised by Orion Partners. We also produced a guide for co-creation methods for others to try out. The Centre for Genomic Regulation in Spain developed the Genigba game app together with citizens, researchers and gamers to understand the genome of cancer cells. To understand the spread of viruses, the Babraham Institute co-created the online vaccine game. New ICT solutions for healthcare in small communities were co-created through the Meltech project run by the National Institute of Health, Carlos III. Through Orion, we also aim to understand what the public thought about a disruptive technology such as genome editing. We held public dialogues in five different countries between members of the public and experts in science, ethics and law to understand different points of view. Another important goal of Orion was to find effective ways to disseminate what we learned. We organised an online course on open science, ran a popular podcast series and held regular open science workshops across Europe. Orion Open Science now leaves behind a legacy of tools, activities and stories to share with others on how to embed open science and RRI in research institutions and funders. To ensure the commitment of Orion partners beyond the project, each of them has generated action plans on open science and RRI. Importantly, we have captured our successes in a series of inspiring stories which show the positive and sometimes surprising effects of co-creation and open science. Thank you, I'll share now my screen. Okay, let me complement with a few thought, thoughts and, and words about the, the movie you just heard. As you, as you, as you heard, the, we have an ambitious goal in, uh, in Orion to embed uh, responsible research innovation principles and open science principle in research organization as well as in funders 
in their policies, in their practices and, and processes, no? to, to organize, to fund and to do research. We are actually towards the end of our journey. We started back in 2017, and now we are going to finish at the end of September, although we hope that the journey will, will continue also beyond the, uh, the funding. So we have different keywords that reflect what we are doing, open processes. We want to trigger cultural changes. We want to engage multiple stakeholders. But here I would like to highlight two other keywords that characterize the project. One is it's life sciences. So we have a focus on a specific disciplines. And within life sciences, we also want uh, to focus on fundamental research. That it's what we are mostly good at within the consortium. So here it's, it's the map you saw in the movie representing the different partners. We have four uh, research institutes, the Center for Genomic Regulation in Spain, where I work, the Babam Institute in UK, the Max Delbruck Research Center in Germany and SciTech in, in Czech Republic. We also have two funding organizations, a larger one in, in Spain on biomedicine and uh, a more focused one, JCMM in Czech Republic. We have two civil society organizations, including VA, who's hosting the workshop today, uh, representing different segments of society. And I think a very important role is placed by a group on social sciences at the University of Barcelona, who has the task to evaluate uh, all the activities that we are performing within, uh, within Ohio. So as, as you could also listen from the multiple co-creation activities, the idea is if we, this is the research cycle no, from the thinking to discovering up to disseminating, we want to try experiments to open up the different phases of the research cycle. We did co-creations, public dialogue, citizen science, some that you also in the audience uh, did, so it would be nice to exchange experience and, and training. And our target audience, you know, to promote these, these changes, I think a very important stakeholder was scientists. The scientists themselves to trigger Eureka moment, you know, to realize the value of engaging different stakeholder in research. And of course, we wanted to target institution, funders, and, and society at, at, uh, uh, at large participating in our, in our activities. So at the core, there are these open experiments, you know, this, this co-creation using different methodology. Uh, an important component I mentioned is open science training. We realize it's very important uh, to, the, to, to train uh, researchers as well as funders in different aspects of open science. And as I said, very important has been all the evaluation and analysis that we have been doing pre and post the, the project, and which is still currently developing. And so this, this picture was taken at the kickoff meeting back in 2017. As you can see, pre-COVID times, we were uh, preparing tapas together. And I think this is, reflects a little bit also what we have been doing through these four years, you know, cooking and trying out different things together. Something worked, something didn't work. And now the, what we are, where we are is this in the thinking and reflecting phase. You know, what, what we learned for our institution, but also what we want to, uh, what is our legacy, what we can share with others. And this is one of the first workshops you know, where we are discussing about, uh, with different stakeholders, about all the activities that, that we organize. And so I think this is something that we can go back at the last uh, section no, to discuss on the legacy. Just give me two, I can give you just a couple of, of examples of, of nice stories. So as you will see also in the Orion website, we have gathered Orion inspiring story. You no know, stories that can tell you a little bit what happened and what, what we learned. And here I highlight a story actually that triggered uh, a change at the national level in Czech Republic. One of the Orion National Stakeholder Workshop organized by our partner at PyTech uh, that took place back in 2018 was attended by multiple stakeholders, not following the philosophy of Orion, funders, companies, scientists, also students. And this National Stakeholder Workshop was very important because it contributed to consolidate views and needs on open science from a variety of stakeholders and actually contributed to draw a national action plan on open science into the public. It's not the main trigger, it was one of the different elements, but I, I think this, this is a very nice example of the changes that Orion could contribute. And the other story that I want to present is more uh, a story of one researcher, no? because I said in Orion, we also want to trigger this Eureka moment. 
And this story comes from Genigma, a citizen science you will heard about in one of the breakout sessions. And here, let me just read the quote from one of the research. It seems to me that many times we scientists are very focused on seeing things and solving problems in the same way. And sometimes using an alternative solution, such as in case citizen science, obviously not all, not all problems, but some problems from this per perspective can be solved. So, and, and this is what exactly, this represents nicely what in Orion we have been trying to uh, look at. So more will come in the breakout sessions and in the uh, final uh, discussion. And now I leave it back to Helen to introduce the next. Question. Thanks very much, Michaela. Thank you. Right. Um, so now um, you've had an overview of Orion, we're going to make it extra difficult for you and invite you to select between two parallel breakouts, so two kind of strands. So rather than try to briefly cover everything we've been doing related to co-creation and engagement, we thought it'd be more interesting to delve a little deeper into some of the activities so you can get a really better understanding of how we went about developing them, the challenges along the way, what we've learned and the outcomes and impact. So we're going to split into two parallel breakouts where we will be having conversations with partners involved in a number of, of the activities. One will be chaired by myself and the other by Maria. And to help you decide which to join, we are going to give you do two pitches and you'll find out where to go for the parallel um, sessions right at the end. So perhaps we could get everyone um, who's involved in the pitches on the spotlight. Um, We got everyone there. Who else we? All right, let's hand over to um, then Maria, Gloria, and Fergus for pitch number one. Thank you, Ellen. So, um, if you would like to go to the breakout session about gamification, co-creation, and gamification. Uh, just give you some information on that. So gamification can be an innovative and fun way to engage specific audiences in complex issues. But what happens when you also involve them in, in the co-creation of the game too? In our breakout session, you can learn about the development of two uh, games developed as a part of the Ryan project. So I'll leave the screen first to Gloria Niagas Pranarubia, who, who is head of communications and PR at the Center for Geomic Regulation in Barcelona. Thanks, Maria, and thanks uh, to the meeting for having me today. Uh, I'm going to talk about Genigma. Genigma is a citizen science game for smartphones managed by the Center for Genomic Regulation in Spain, in which gamers will help researchers discover the genomic alterations in cancer cells. The game has been developed via a series of co-creation events involving cancer patients, patient groups and professionals from a variety of fields such as research, medicine, bioethics, education, communication and art in, in various stages of the development process. I'll be talking about how we involve different profiles of citizens in the collection of ideas for designing the game through three co-creation events a play test from the analogic to the digital version of the games and how a group of students helped to co-design the communication to peers. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Gloria. And I will be talking about Vaccine. Uh, Vaccine is a project to produce a digital game called Virus Break, um, initiated by the Babraham Institute in the UK as a tool to engage the public with the science behind vaccinations, infections, and the immune system. Uh, the game is being co-created together with young people aged 13 to 14 from a local state school in Cambridge in the UK to stimulate novel ideas and insights and improve the game's appeal to this demographic. So I'll be talking about how we involve young people in the design and testing process, the benefits of using co-creation tools and engaging through play and gamification. Great. Um, so here is our pitch for the second choice and parallel session on engagement and dialogue in practice. So when and how should we engage with the public in complex and controversial issues and new disruptive technologies? And how can we do this effectively? The Orion Project has been testing out several different methodologies for stimulating dialogue, gathering opinions and exploring complex subjects. 
In our breakout session, you will be hearing about the successes, challenges and learnings from three activities, including public dialogues and an arts residency and art installation. Emma. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. So during the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021, Orion conducted a series of public dialogues in four European countries. And that was to explore public attitudes or to genome editing in life sciences fundamental research. So we wanted to know what were the views of the citizens on risks and opportunities of using genome editing in fundamental research, but also how can we best engage with them um, and also tangentially, we wanted to know whether public engagement approaches differ between countries. Um, so in this session, I will try to give a brief overview of what we learned in terms of motivations from the different stakeholders, the challenges that we encounter, and what we have learned uh, by organizing these dialogues. And the picture you see in my slide is a, a science art picture, which my colleague uh, Luisa Langston will explain a little bit more in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, at the Center for Genomic Regulation, the CRG in Spain, we, ra we run an online public dialogue to inform our next strategic plan. And I, I will be talking about how we successfully run the dialogue, which was transformed from a face-to-face -face activity into an online one due to, due to the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. Um, the ways in which these engagement activities transforming the work of our research center and how it has changed certain participants' perceptions. And Luisa, over to you. And hello. And I'll be talking about the, the already mentioned arts project. So I will tell you all about what happened when we invited an artist to work together alongside the Dawai scientist to produce a proof of concept for a speculative um, object um, and to reflect on the research we're doing on genome editing, where it actually leads to and what it could lead to. And I will also tell you uh, how the speculative object that the artist created is now actually becoming scientific reality much faster than we thought. Thank you. So if you're interested in learning about some examples of engagement and dialogue in practice, um, please join um, our session. So now it is time to make your choice. Um, so if you want to join the co-creation and gamification um, session um, breakout, which is hosted by Maria, um, you actually need to leave this room and go to another Zoom meeting. And the link for that is going, going to be posted in the chat. If you want to join the session on engagement and dialogue, so the public dialogues and arts projects, please stay here in this Zoom meeting. We will all be brought back together at the end um, after our conversation. So um, please make your choice now. So is it in the in the in the chat the link? I'm just adding the breakout. Is someone managing to post the link? <laughs> Brilliant. There we are. Go. Thanks, Maria. So that is the Zoom meeting if you would like to join the gamification um, breakout conversation. Right. So we will say bye to some of our colleagues and as they head off into the other session. <laughs> And we will just wait for, for other people to leave. So you lost. Great. Let's get started then. So welcome to this uh, parallel breakout um, on engagement dialogue in practice. So as I mentioned, it's going to take a form of a conversation between me and um, three Orion partners, and we hope that this format will bring out a range of interesting aspects about the activities that we're running. So ideally, we'd all be sitting around on sofas with a nice cup of coffee, having a chat, um, but obviously we can't do that, but hopefully some of you have got a cup of coffee in, in front of you. We'd love to answer any questions that you have, so just post those in the chat um, and we'll keep an eye out um, for them.
So firstly, I'd like to introduce the three Orion partners. So we have Emma Martinez, who is Public Engagement Officer at the Babraham Institute in the UK. Emma has been particularly involved in face-to-face -face public dialogues um, that we held in several countries. Um, and we also have um, Marta Solis, who is um, from the Centre for Genomic Regulation in Spain. Um, as was mentioned, due to the pandemic, they ended up holding the public dialogue online, um, which had slightly different objectives and approach. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear um, their perspectives too. And thirdly, we're joined by Louisa Bengson, who is Public Engagement and Knowledge Exchange Officer at the Max Delbruck Centre for Molecular Medicine in the Helmholtz Association in Berlin, in Germany. Um, who instigated um, an arts residency that resulted in an interesting arts installation that has been used by during the project. So let's start um, by find, finding out a little bit more about the, the projects that we're going to be talking about, um, about today. So Emma, would you like to start and just um, tell us a bit about the public dialogues? Thank you very much, Helen. My pleasure. So as I mentioned, we coordinated a public dialogue in four European countries to find out public attitudes on genome editing in fundamental life science research. Um, so the process of the public dialogue itself was split in two stages. The first stage revolved around developing the project proposal and the stimulus materials that will be shown to the public. And this was done in collaboration with Orion partners, so some of us sitting here in this session, but also with internal and external stakeholders to the organizing um, to the participating organization. The second stage of the public dialogue then involved a deliberative workshop that brought together 30 members of the public um, together with scientists and representatives from the different stakeholders twice in the center of Cambridge at the end of 2019 and, and then in Stockholm, Berlin, Prague in January and February of 2020. This is in a nutshell. In a nutshell, brilliant. Okay. And um, Marta, would you like to explain about yours? You're, you're muted, I think. Sorry. Um, yeah, so another public dialogue was conducted in 2020, uh, but this one was focused on the CRG strategy um, in order to explore how to incorporate the views of citizens and stakeholders into the CRG strategic plan for 2021-2024. Uh, this dialogue was initially planned to be done face to face, but we needed to, to transform it, uh, as you said, um, Helen, into an online event due to the COVID pandemic. Um, a total of three online, online workshops were held involving 31 citizens, 32 stakeholders from different fields and 15 scientists. And through six case studies, we discussed topics related to the CRG, like uh, basic versus applied research, our funding, the need for ethical and, and societal debates, and also how to effectively communicate our research and engage with citizens. And in addition to uh, our internal coordination of the project, we collaborated with Ipsos Mori, which is a global market organization, uh, a company, sorry, to help design and, and conduct the dialogues. Great, thank you. And um, Louisa, tell us a bit about the um, arts residency. We teamed up with Studio, which is um, a um, art science agency um, or company um, in Berlin. Um, when and uh, had an open call for science uh, for sorry for artists um, whom or uh, whom we wanted to invite to come to MDC and produce a uh, art piece on topic of genome editing. We did not want to control what kind of piece uh, art piece will be uh, produced. So we did not want to know whether it's gonna be a sculpture, a movie, a painting or whatever. We didn't also want to give a direction of like what we want to get out of this. We really wanted the artists to work together with scientists and see what happens. And this is exactly what happened. We had an open call. We had uh, 40 submissions from 12 different countries. We selected Emilia Tika, a Finnish artist who is based in Berlin. That was an excellent choice. <laughs> Emilia came to our research labs for uh, three months. Um, after a bit shaky, rocky start, um, she did, um, find a common language with scientists and the scientists found a common language with her and then she produced a speculative design art piece it's an inhalator you've already seen the picture of it uh, where you inhale CRISPR to rejuvenate yourself and um, I could talk forever about all the uh, interesting 
little misunderstandings and conflicts and translation problems we had in the interaction between scientists and artists, but it all got solved. And actually um, this inhalator, basically, so it, you, inject, um, you inhale CRISPR and then you rejuvenate, rejuvenate cells. That was like the speculative design. Basically you can heal, you can activate certain genes um, or I can activate certain genes with the, with the CRISPR in the inhalator. And she also produced a uh, photo, um, like photo um, exhibition where there's a couple, uh, he inhales, she doesn't. How does their life look like? How do they interact with each other, with nature, with death, with life? And this is something together in the exhibition, the inhalator, the scientific part was a microscope where you could see the cells she was working on. So she did have a proof of concept in lab that's actually scientifically actually possible in a certain way, at least in the cell culture in very controlled conditions. Um, this together forced the audience to reflect on where is the science now? Where is it going? How soon can we actually be doing these things? Are we aware of it? And do we want it? And how can we how can we interact with this uh, new technologies? This was uh, hugely successful. A lot of, um, well, at least a lot of media attention was there and a lot of people came to the different exhibitions of this art piece. Uh, people are still talking about it somehow. There are always, uh, there's still, um, still uh, references to this art piece. And actually what I also want to say that, uh, you know that now there's an inhalator for hamsters at least to uh, cure COVID <laughs> with CRISPR. So uh, science kind of caught up the, the artistic speculative vision. Fantastic, thanks. <laughs> Um, so let's start, uh, let's talk a bit about motivation and how that relates to the participants experience. So how did you motivate people to participate, um, not just the public, but also all the other stakeholders involved in your activities, so researchers and uh, others. So what did participants do you feel get, got out of the activity? Um, so um, Marta, do you, want to, do you want to answer that one first? Yeah, sure. So in our case, um, regarding the citizens that participated, um, it's important to say that they were paid. So uh, in our case, this was key for their implication as they were all very more motivated to learn about science really, and to explore different, different points of view of the rest of participants. Um, but beyond money, they were all very enthusiastic for giving, being given the, the opportunity uh, to be part of, of the dialogue and to learn about uh, the CRG scientific research, uh, but especially uh, they have a direct interaction, uh, especially to have a direct interaction with, with scientists, which uh, this is what they value uh, the most. So it's, it's interesting to, to know. Uh, regarding the uh, stakeholders, um, we just asked them to take part in the exercise and they were all very collaborative and, and enthusiastic. Uh, just for the fact of, of being asked uh, about the CRG strategic plan. And also they saw an opportunity you know, to, to know about citizens' expectations also and, and concerns and to explore uh, also a new way of, of, of this uh, engagement uh, format. And, and then, then they really ask nothing in return. So this was very nice. And about the scientists uh, from the CRG that uh, we invited, uh, they were very open in general and, and found the exercise very interesting for the value of inter interacting with citizens and stakeholders so that they, they could learn about uh, their different needs and, and expectations and to have these one-to-one -one conversations. Uh, it's true that uh, the majority of scientists that we invited, invited were previously open to public engagement. So I think this, is, this was an, impact, an important factor, of course, for the, for the success of, of their implication. Thanks, Marta. And Emma, was there a similar experience with you? Or? Yeah, so uh, in the case of the public, similarly as Marta, because also Ipsos Mori was an organization who conducted the public dialogues on genome editing for Orion. So the public participants, they did receive a small uh, uh, financial incentive. But this is a common practice in market research just to ensure that you have a diversity of opinions and that actually that the people are committed. But like Marta said, it is really interesting because we then probed their attitudes to participating in this research. And it was not just the money itself, but it was like they were really to be invited to this opportunity to, to, to steer a little bit with scientific research. So they were very pleased. Um, in the case of uh, the external stakeholders that we consulted in order to develop all the materials that we will be shown to the public, um, the, the, main, the main motivation for them to join was to stay abreast 
of developments in shared areas of interest. Genome editing is very topical at the moment. I mean, we've been dealing with it since 2013, that it really heated in all labs around the world. Um, so all funders were very interested to know what was going on and what the research performing organizations were doing and where the public dialogue was heading to. So I had no problems in finding collaborators in, in, in external stakeholders. Um, and in the case of scientists, similar to what Marta said, um, indeed, there were people who were already interested in the interface between science and society. So there were people who were already to some extent practicing public engagement, um, but they, they, they wanted to have this opportunity to have to discuss more controversial topics of science. So they saw this as a, as, a, as a really good platform to practice their communication skills and to understand different points of views. And indeed, they have acknowledged participating in that. It was a bit of a Eureka moment, like Michaela said in the very beginning, as in it has made them see the public as interested and involved in scientific research, even though that they might not be properly involved at the moment, but they are interested. So we need to reach out more to them. That was the message that the scientists themselves got. And in the case of participating organization, I already mentioned, so we wanted to know the views of the public and how do they weight benefits versus risks. And other partners that have participated in these public dialogues who took part in four different European countries, as I mentioned, they also wanted to know how engaged were their national audiences already. How much did they know about the topic? Um, so how much work they still had to do or not? And also to learn from other partners participating in this in multinational public dialogue who were more experienced in public dialogues and public engagement. Thanks, Emma. Louisa, I know yours is a slightly different kind of project, but is there anything? It's not that different, actually. I mean, I would summarize like the motivation for participation in this project was actually curiosity on all parts. So uh, the artists are curious about what's going on in the labs. This was an amazing opportunity for this for the artists to um, actually take a really unfiltered peek into what's going on in daily life in the in the research lab. The scientists were also curious um, about what do artists do with our work? Like what's what's going to happen there. And also a lot of scientists actually are artists, as we found out through, through this project. So that was quite interesting. I mean, almost everybody that participates in this does something. It, it not, does, not, doesn't have to be like visual arts, but music or arts or uh, whatever. I mean, people actually are very creative. Um, and maybe that was a bit selected, uh, self-selecting for scientists who are more creative and the hobbies as others I don't know but curiosity was the the key and also for the institutions or for the MDC itself we were basically curious what happens if we bring in artists into our research labs will it be a disaster will it be interesting will it be useful um, it was basically curiosity and that's why we also didn't want to steer the process too much so uh, we left it very open and just let things happen in a facilitated way, of course. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Which answers the question. Maybe I can quickly answer the question in the chat, like um, um, how to, and tips for speeding up the process of finding common language. It's really the facilitation. So you really do need a public engagement professional who is there and can go between the scientists and the artists and kind of translate, at least in the beginning, to start up the collaboration. This is really the key. Thanks. Yes, there's a question about challenges, which we were going to talk about um, as well. So what were the challenges that you faced and how do you do you overcome them? Obviously, we're talking about quite complex to topics, you know, genome editing and the public dialogues. Um, and obviously, you know, at the um, at your Institute, Louisa, there's a lot of fundamental sort of research that's going going on. So it's all complex stuff. So how, um, you know, what kind of challenges did and um, th that present? And also generally, what other challenges did you did you come across? So Louisa, do you want to um, start with that one? I think really the, the, the biggest challenge was uh, to get the two worlds, the, the art world uh, and the scientific world to, uh, to basically start talking to each other in a, from, um, from eye level position. So from beginning, somehow there was like this 
tension where the artist was trying to go like, you know, from my view, that's what I'm doing. And the scientist like, that's not like how you do it. So um, there was a bit of tension in the beginning. And I think that was interesting. It was a good tension because it's really um, this clash of cultures. We had like an opening event where we brought scientists and the artists together and she presented her vision and the scientists were shouting, there's not possible, what's crazy, inhalator, CRISPR, it's never going to work. And she's like, but this is art, so it doesn't have to work and, and so on and so on. So uh, there was like a lot of this um clash of cultures going on and that was a challenge in the beginning um but we quickly resolved that another challenge was basically time um so time is like with any activities you do in research institutions time is always a factor so uh the artist comes and commits a full that's about her project right but the scientist that's like a side project that's not their full time thing that they do. So that's quite a challenge to get this uh, working. And um, otherwise, I'd say it's a challenge. It's a creative challenge. It's a good challenge. So there's, uh, there's, there's nothing like, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work <laughs> to make it work. Uh, but it pays off in the end. So even though it's a challenge, it's definitely, um, it's also an opportunity to introduce some new perspectives, new creativity, new energy into the research institutions. Fantastic. And what about um, the public dialogues? What sort of challenges did you um, have there? Emma, do you want to start? So these public dialogues were a very ambitious project because it spanned over two years and it involved many different stakeholders. So I guess one of the main challenges that anybody could face in such a project is the internal buy-in. So, and in order to solve this, um, what we did was to bring our internal stakeholders from the very beginning on. So from the moment the grant was, was granted, the grant agreement was gone and we knew that it was going to happen. We were already informing our internal audiences that we are having this opportunity coming. So by the time we had to recruit internal audiences, then it was a little bit easier. I'm not saying it was extremely smooth and easier, but it was easier because they were already there. And um, also part of the internal buying process was to involve internal stakeholders, the same as external ones, in developing those materials. So the project specification, which is the document that outlines everything that we want to achieve with this project, was done coll collaboratively among all of us. So not only the Orion partners, but it was also done with uh, stakeholders in all the participating organizations, such as the MDC in Berlin and uh, uh, VA in uh, Sweden and, and and say take in the Czech Republic. So all the different stakeholders who participated in the dialogue at a certain point, they also inputted, they were invited to input it into the very initial documents. That is a very important point for the internal buy-in. Um, and another one is to, and it's one of the questions that I see in the chat. So how do you recruit stakeholders in this case? Um, and this is one of the learnings I have had during this public dialogue. So how do you, establish and nurture relationships, basically. That question comes down to that. So what I have learned is that you need to establish those communication channels as soon as possible. Do not wait for the opportunity to arise, but start mapping which stakeholders are important for your organization and start making those contacts because one day you want them on board for project S, Y, Z, like such as this public dialogue. So in our case, we had direct communications channels with funders, let's say, but we, did not have such communication channels open with bioethicists. And this was a key pillar. So that was a very strong challenge we found and we didn't found a way around. No, great, thanks. And Marta, obviously you had you had the pandemic to deal with as well. So, um, and obviously how, what kind of challenges did you have? I mean, do you think holding it online made a difference or um, perhaps you can tell us a bit about that? Yeah, of course, um, the pandemic uh, was an unexpected issue that we didn't um, expect it. So uh, we need to transform this face-to-face -face, um, activity as we initially planned it to be to an online one. So uh, this added a layer, a layer of complexity in our case, but because one of the major challenges for us is that this was our very first public dialogue uh, ever at the CRG. So we didn't have the experience uh, in organizing uh, this kind of, of dialogues. Um, and we have even never attended one. So this was 
this was a challenge, although we were, we were inspired by a, by a similar exercise uh, at the Abraham Institute. And, and we had also an in-depth visit uh, that helped us uh, understand uh, the, needs, the needs of this exercise, of course, but, but it's not the same to see what others are doing that doing it in, in yourself, right? So, and uh, this was a big challenge that of course um, was bigger with these uh, pandemics and the need to do it online. Uh, although, although this online format had also uh, some benefits for sure. And for example, that allow us, allowed us to engage the stakeholders easily and that uh, there were not uh, geographic barriers with participants as we could engage uh, citizens from all over Spain that we, which uh, would haven't been possible if, if, uh, if we will, would have been, if we will do it um, face to face. And I, I saw another question here about the uh, participants and how we recruited them. So uh, in our case, uh, it was Ipsos Mori, the company uh, that collaborated to design and conduct the dialogues uh, who uh, recruited the participants, the citizens um, in a representative way of, of the Spanish society, kind of, because in the end, we only invited 33 people, which it's, it can be representative, hundred percent. But uh, they try to, they try to, and um, we also create create an online citizens community, which which was great uh, because they had the opportunity to, to interact uh, before the workshops uh, themselves, and and this was this was great. Um, yeah, regarding the online the online format. Uh, that were the challenges, although they, we had other challenges as well <laughs> beyond this. Great, thanks, Monica. Um, Louisa, there's um, there's some uh, co um, questions coming in. You might just want to quickly answer about how, because obviously the art res residency, but we had the art installation. Perhaps you could say a little bit about what we've done with the you know the outcomes from that initiative. Yeah, I was trying to multitask here and listen and write in the chat. So <laughs> I sorry, thought easier, my comments in the chat a bit easier for you to talk than uh, than try and write yeah. desperately to write. Um, yeah, so the the public uh, the, the public the the art installation uh, that was uh, exhib exhibited at, in several um, different locations um, around Europe. We already mentioned that, and um, sorry, there's um, some construction work. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, basically, we, but it was used not only as a um, exhibition for the public, but we also used it in several different occasions as an input. So, for example, it was the the input for the <coughs> for the public dialogues. So that went over quite a long time, but also for different scientific symposia for different audiences that we did here at the MDC, for example. We also used it for, for example, open days or building science week where we had the basically the art piece ex, um, exhibited in our institution. Uh, luckily, we do have space for that. That's, I know it's not the case for everybody, uh, every institution, but um, it, it was here and we have several thousand people coming through here and interacting with the art. and. You could see that this is something that gets people really thinking about science. It's really, it's not just something that um, we produced, we hanged and it's there. It, the, this art piece was so emotional. It was a bit gloomy, a bit, um, um, not dystopian, but a bit um, dark <laughs> in a way, which kind of made the people think, but then when you uh, when they interact with the piece, when they actually read all the uh, all the scientific explanation and saw the the cells and the microscope, and there's like uh, it was this the combination of the art of the actual object that you could almost touch and the the photography really created this moment of okay, well actually the the topic of longevity is quite emotional, but is science really able to do that? And uh, then you can start talking about science, what it can do or what it cannot and where we're at now. And I thought that was very valuable. Uh, these were very valuable interactions. And with the, the art piece was always accompanied by scientists who were there to explain what's going on there. So it's worth, worth reiterating. So the heart of it was about, would you like to live forever? Um, yeah. wasn't it? And there was a, a couple, one, one inhaled and was gonna live forever. And the other one was, um, was aging. So uh, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, obviously stimulated lots of um, lots of discussion and, and and internal kind of reflection as well for, for people. 
Great. Um, so, um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about, um, did you see any attitude changes through the activities? Um, you know, was there any scepticism at the start or, or what, you know, how did, or um, so both in terms of all the different types of participants or um, stakeholders that were in, involved. Um, Emma, do you want to answer that one first? So, as I said, as I mentioned briefly before, um, I did see an attitude change from the scientists participating as experts in the public, in their workshops with the public. So, we talk about how scientifically engaged they are or they are not, the, the citizens and society as a whole, but the scientists were very pleased to engage in in-depth conversation with them and, and see what kind of questions were coming from them. And what they learned in this exercise is that indeed the public was, was engaged and it was interested on, on genome editing as itself, but also in the type of research that all participating organizations do. So life science fundamental research, which is difficult to convey to society because it doesn't have a direct application. So these kind of opportunities in which you can go in detail in the conversation, it was an eye opener both for the public because they understood what are we doing in fundamental research and also for the scientists, because they see that once they understand what we are doing, they are really interested and they are very supportive. That was another key message that we learned in the public dialogue. There was a broad support for fundamental research. We just need to communicate more and louder about it. Great. And Marta, did you notice anything? Yeah, so uh, I totally agree with uh, Emma's views about the citizens and that when you explain why basic science is important they understood it and they valued much more than before in our in our case it happened exactly the same with our citizens uh, participating and um, at the CRG also a remarkable change in attitude uh, was the one from the CRG director as he initially was a bit skeptical about opening up our research to citizens maybe as I said before due to this lack of previous uh, similar experiences at the CRG, so he didn't know what to expect, no? and there's always this kind of fear. Um, and also, he initially thought about maybe more uh, um, a one direction uh, communications activity, like a more impactful in terms of participants and public recognition. But uh, after uh, he participated very proactively in the dialogues, uh, he really valued the exercise uh, very positively and and finally, uh, two more public dialogues uh, were included in the new CRG strategic plan. So uh, this was a very remarkable attitude change and very important one as Orion itself. And this dialogue especially aims at triggering a change in, in scientists and institutions. Um, and regarding this attitude change in scientists, we, we have several uh, successful stories as well. And, and especially one from a senior scientist who realized that it's very important to think about the societal and ethical impact of, of the research on a daily basis in, uh, at the lab and, and with a wider perspective, perspective even when from the beginning when you write the project. So, so, um, so it's very important to, to, to take them into, into account. So, yeah. Um, Luisa, any changes, attitude changes? Definitely. Um, I mean, for the artist itself, uh, she still uh, out in the public saying that uh, in from the media, you see, uh, you think that everything is so easy in science, you just uh, go in, you take something from this shelf and this shelf, you mix a bit, then you make an experiment and wow, now you've learned something, right? <laughs> and she said, this is even though that you kind of instinctively think, well, probably there's more behind it, but actually working in the lab and understanding what a process, what an actual also a craft science is and what it takes to actually understand something or even just have an experiment done right and understand, okay, this experiment is really saying something to me. She was, she said there was very invaluable um, information that uh, this, um, that really changed her perception on how science works and what also is said about science in public. And she is also spreading this, this message to her fellow uh, artists and her peers in her peer group. So that from the artist's perspective, that was the, exactly what we want to achieve to understand how scientific process works. Okay. Um, and on this. Oh, 
with the public. They mm -hmm. understand that nothing bad has happened. <laughs> and even though the artist had really free reign basically to create whatever art she wanted, because the interaction, the work together with her was so intensive and so good, uh, nothing bad happened. It's actually, it's okay to speculate about the future. And again, the future became truth kind of. So, so she was actually right. Yeah, exactly. Great. Uh, right, we've got about four minutes uh, left. Um, there's two, I don't know whether we can get two questions done. Um, first, we've talked a little bit about this, but in terms of what do you see the benefits of doing these kind of act activities? Um, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, Marta, do you want to quick comment yeah. about that? Yeah, sure. So I think there are a lot of benefits in this in these kind of activities. First of all, as I, as I just explained, uh, the change of perceptions in in CRG in the CRG scientists that participated in in the in the dialogues, especially regarding citizens' opinions about basic science and and of the value of their diverse angles and and perspective for for their science and for the science of of the center. Um, also, um, a, a very valuable benefit is to establish this dialogue, this bilateral conversation with citizens. So both citizens and, and scientists become more sensibilized and understanding of other angles, angles and, and perspectives. Um, of course, in our case, uh, it was important to make visible the CRG among, among people that didn't, didn't know about us and to make a, val a valuable impact in the citizens that participated as they had a very immersive experience. Um, of course, uh, a very important benefit is to be ethically responsible and, and align with, with society. Um, or also to nurture relationship with, with our stakeholders, um, uh, to foster also conversations between scientists with, among them because about certain topics, especially about ethical and societal issues that otherwise would have never happened. They, they just basically wouldn't think about that. Right. And of course, yeah, to inform our strategic plan is, is a very uh, open way to, to do it. Thanks. And Louisa, any final things about benefits? Yeah, it's always beneficial to disrupt and shake up the, the field a bit. So, uh, you know, if you, if you work in an institution where things are done in a certain way, it's always good to bring someone from outside and shake it up. <laughs> and that's what Emilia Tika did just by her presence in our institution, just her physical presence, because this was really a visible person. This really changed things. Something was happening in the atmosphere and that's good. I think that's uh, something that's not tangible. You cannot really put the finger on and say, this is exactly what's beneficial, but just this, I, this idea, or like this having the opportunity to have this outside perspective and it's there and it's visible and it's kind of, you know, like it's, it's there, it's present. Um, that's good, that's always good, so. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think we've been joined by the um, other people back from the other, other session. So thanks, Emma, Marta, Louisa, and we hope you found that, um, that discussion um, useful, everyone, um, and inter interesting getting in some insights into that project. So I think we are, um, yes, Maria, I can see Maria, you're back from your session. Fantastic. So uh, Perhaps we could get the uh, spotlights kind of uh, re reorganized. So we can come back to our final session. We just need Michaela as well. We'll try and find Michaela in a minute. Right, welcome back everyone. So we hope you found those conversations um, interesting. Um, so now we want to bring you back um, and really talk about the future applications of um, Orion and Open Science. So key to this um, conference on the future of science communication is all about reflecting um, about what happens next. So how can we use what we've learned um, to really inform our future work? So I'd like to invite, invite back three of our speakers and project partners. So we are Michaela Bertero from the Center for Genomic Regulation in Spain, Emma Martinez uh, from the Babraham Institute in the UK, and Louisa Bengston from the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular um, Medicine in Germany. So um, we've got a little panel here, and um, we just want to have a reflect upon uh, sort of the legacy of the Orion project. Um, if anyone has any um, comments or reflections, please add them into the chat too. 
So Michaela, first start with you. Um, obviously today we've heard quite about, a lot about um, various um, Orion activity, project activities and what has been achieved. So perhaps you could share a few thoughts about um, that and the legacy of the Orion project. Yeah, sure. As I, as I mentioned initially, we are still in the reflecting mode. We have been doing so many act activities now and now we want to uh, to see a little bit what, what we learned, but maybe I can make a, a list now of what I think we can uh, we can leave and, and share with uh, with other. First of all, all the the co-creation activities that we have been doing, we want to we have been documented them in in detail, so for others to reproduce. And what I I said in my presentation, a great asset for Orion has been also the evaluation exercises by social science by this group of social scientists. So, and this is kind of a luxury in uh, in public engagement. Not not often you can do such in depth analysis. So I I think that will be an important legacy, and that will be as each uh, each co-creation will have its its evaluations and. And uh, also like how you can reproduce it sort of it. We said we were doing experiments. So as an experiment, we want to leave behind the, the protocols for others to, to reproduce. Then all the, the tools that we have been using, this will also be, uh, and some are already available online. So the co-creation uh, menu, uh, or all the surveys that we run, also all this methodology is, is available. And of course we want to follow a philosophy of open science. So this is, um, online and free to reuse and, and, and share. Related to this, also all the training that Max Delp and Luisa here develop and we should tell more, more. This is also available. It's in the nodal, uh, the, um, the fact sheets, the case studies, uh, the, the online training that developed. So this is also something that we want other to reuse. Um, and I think importantly also are these inspiring stories. No? So once it's the protocol, what happened? And then uh, it's the it's really the inspiring story we want to, to capture uh, maybe some illumination, some eureka moments, so the, the impact, of course, it's short-term impact because long-term will be beyond the lifetime of the, of the project. So I think we hope the inspiring story also will be useful for, for others. And the action plans, no? So we want, uh, Orion to continue also beyond the lifetime of the other project. And so uh, the research institute, as well as the funders are committed uh, and they, they are developing, this is work in progress, so, but they will be available also online uh, to action plans, no specific action they commit in the next few years uh, to continue to build upon Orion because we are all aware that institutional cultural changes cannot happen just in, in four years. You're muted, Ellen. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Emma. So, um, Michaela's just briefly mentioned the action um, and plan. So, yeah, what I was going to ask you is what's happening at an institutional level? So, how is this, what impact is this having actually on the work of the partner um, institutions? Yeah. So we've learned a lot over these last four years. So not only with the public dialogues, but like Michaela said, with all the other activities that we or our partners have been doing in the Rajon project. And this has ultimately resulted in the Babraham Institute where I work in an action plan on open science. And this is designed around the eight pillars that the commission identified for open science and the activities that are suggested in that action plan lead in the stream of either leadership <clears throat> or communications or skills for our staff. Um, so it's a two years uh, action plan. And uh, as Michaela said, we hope to publish this soon. Um, and this is in order to support continuing with the work that we have been doing over the last four years. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and Louisa, we, um, we haven't um, talked much about training, but maybe you could say a little bit about the tra training we've been doing and sort of the legacy in terms of Orion. Yeah, we've been conducting open science training um, across Europe. So I think if we calculate it all together, it was like over 500 participants and I think 12 different countries. So there was a lot of traveling <laughs> in the beginning, then a lot of online, a lot of Zooming. All these uh, trainings are also online. Uh, there are two MOOCs, one um, 
MOOC on Open Science in Life Sciences and also a MOOC for Train the Trainers. So if you want to become a trainer in Open Science, you can take our MOOC for Train the Trainer. Um, but what I would like to say about the training, what, what I found really interesting when we started the project in 2017 and started designing the training was mo more about convincing people that Open Science actually is something that exists and that there are certain tools there and this can be done. And for example, I very vividly remember that beginning of 2018, we were still debating with scientists whether preprints are a good idea or not. And this has changed so much. I think, uh, of course, not only due Orion, but um, we have arrived in a different uh, reality now where open science is kind of obvious it needs to be done. Open data is a huge field and is really going forward very fast. And I think the legacy of Orion is that we, we did produce the very first steps for like raising awareness about open science. And this is now spreading and developing. And there is a lot of, there's still a lot of need out there. And people are still interested in knowing a bit more about what is this thing, open science, what can it actually do for me and what can I, how can I use it to do something better for the, for the world. So I think this is the, the main legacy uh, for us from our side, the MDC. I mean, all the public engagement projects were amazing. We learned a lot and we're cooperating all these elements into our new strategy as well. But the open science training has been really instrumental. Great, thanks, Louisa. Um, and then a final, a final kind of question is: um, I mean, obviously, we, you know, um, this has been a big, um, big, big project. Um, we've had four, four years, and some of these projects have taken quite um, a lot of effort and time, resources. Um, so, question is: Can so can you do open science stakeholder engagement on a shoestring, sort of with limited resources and limited, limited time? So, uh, Emma, do you want to? Do you want to have a go at answering that one? <laughs> so I, I guess it has been clear from my breakout session, from my participation, that making a public dialogue is a big investment in terms of time and resources. That's a, that's a no-brainer. So, um, But it, it, whether you can do it on a shoestring will depend on whether you have certain, um, certain infrastructures and certain services already in the organizations. So for example, uh, a good uh, partners and, and client relationship management strategy and the tools. So was those, those relationships that I was mentioning in the breakout session, how do you establish and how do you nurture relationships? So if you already have that in place, that is already one step forward and then your advantage for doing this on a shoestring. Um, and then, Another important key factor for making a public dialogue successful is to have the knowledge on developing and adapting content to be shown to the different stakeholders. As I mentioned, it was a very inclusive uh, process that we have uh, achieved with uh, the public dialogue. So we involve many different stakeholders, including the public. So how do you talk with each of them and how do you adapt the content to each of them? So this was also professionally done in our case. If you have that expertise in home, at home, then that that's another factor. Um, then another important one for public dialogues is the facilitation itself. So um, mo many of us, including myself, are public engagement professionals and might have already extensive experience on facilitating things, but not, it's not always the case. And it's different how you facilitate a focus group and how you facilitate a public dialogue with the, with the public. A public dialogue workshop, sorry. And finally, it's uh, about um, once you have gathered all the data, how do you interpret and how do you synthesize the different theme themes and how do you report on those? So if you have all the skills at home in the house, then I think it, it is perfectly possible to do it in a shoestring. But we had to commission this whole public dialogue to an external organization and then you keep on adding cost. Okay, great. Thanks, Emma. Uh, right, um, time is running out and we need to bring our discussions to a close. But before we finish, we have uh, two important things um, to do. Um, firstly, before I, go, I was going to say to the speakers, perhaps you can put your email addresses in the chat so people can get in contact with you um, directly. Um, but I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Maria, again. Um, oops. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Helen. So I hope now after having got all this information and uh, in the breakout, the discussions in the breakout rooms, etc., that you are inspired to do more of the stakeholder engagement, co-creation and game design. But we would also like to capture this. So I would like you to once again go to the menti.com uh, and share your views about how 
inspired you've been or not by what we've said? So you're, you're totally anonymous as well. So you can, you're free to say what you want. You can see the code on the top of the slide. So 57679271. Exactly. Thank you, Emma. So we inspired at least half of, a little bit, a little bit less than half of the people joining. And also, we would also like to know uh, what do you take away from this event? What were your thoughts, your ideas, your views? Can see there are more information on the methods that we can provide through the Orion Open Science website. Science engagement is fun, both sides. Art science is a powerful tool. like to have more have answers to questions and breakout that we can provide we can get in touch with you afterwards and you can also also have a look at the Orion website we will make a summary from this event and also this event is recorded so we'll have a look at the chat questions give the participatory design process time and space yes that's true gamification is interesting but very resource consuming well, thank you. Thank you for all these all these views about this session. And now I'll hand over to Michaela, who will say some final words. Well, it's it's time for for closing the session. But I would like to thank you also for your for your participation. And we are very open also to to be in touch with you. So if you have more questions, you can reach any of of, of us. And I think Maria, you have. Um, yes, surprise. I'll, sh I'll share my screen. So as I mentioned initial, uh, like in this last uh, sessions, what we are leaving behind. So we prepared, actually Maria prepared a virtual uh, goodie bag uh, of Orion Open Science. So you will get the link. And there you will see all the uh, inspiring story that we mentioned, Sorry. the co-creation menus, the tools, the training, if you want to um, try it out, uh, the how-to guides. So this is uh, a page that summarizes a little bit what we have produced and we will continue to update. As I said, we are reaching the end, but it's, near, it's still not over. And we would like to take the opportunity to invite you to our final uh, workshops that will be in uh, September. So Maria, do we have also the, uh, the details on the final workshop? Here it is. So mark it in your calendar, 27, 28th of September. So you heard today about some stories, but here we want to uh, tell you also about other stories, other things that happen within uh, Orion. So on this 27 will be more a project showcase. So really we will discuss co-creation, engagement and, and dialogues. And the 28th, we want to, have to be more like a policy discussion. So also bringing in the national and European dimension and discussing what's, uh, what's next. So we hope to see many of you there. And we would like to thank you again also on behalf of all Orion Consortium of uh, this nice workshop and interaction. Thanks a lot. And a special thanks to Maria and Helen for organizing this and keeping all of us on, on track. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. And yeah. to all of you here in the audience.
Yeah, thanks everyone. It's been great, great to uh, interact with you.